awesome. Thanks, David. Well, hello, all. I am Nathan Miller, the worship and youth pastor here at Wellspring. If you don't know me, thanks, guys. And I am excited to bring this word to you. I played at a Christian music festival years ago, and I remember there was this band that got up and played How He Loves, just like you guys just did. And, and that was so beautiful. Stacy and the band, thank you guys so much. And it, it was funny because at that festival, I then heard, uh, it was like this good old boy from Arkansas, and he was about to do his kind of honky-tonk music or whatever he did. And he was like, now I just heard some sweet girls singing about God's love. And I, that's true, but God's also calling y'all to repent. <laughs> And it was kind of a funny, memorable little contrast. And it's funny because I think that's what I'm going to be doing today, right after you guys sing about God's love. And the two, of course, as you know, are not separate in any way. They're actually closely and beautifully related. So uh, what I want to express to you today, I think, is pretty simple. It's that God's plan for the world is to have a people who are filled with the Holy Spirit, and the way for us to be a part of that is repentance. Let me say that last part again. The way for us to be a part of that is repentance. I want to tell you a brief story before I dive into this text. The last church that I was a part of, it's called Christ Community Church in Denton. It was a sweet time to be a part of it. Dustin was there for a long time as well. And the Lord did something there. Before the Lord called me here to Wellspring in 2020, we went through something at that church in 2018 that was extremely memorable to me. It was a church plant, uh, and we didn't own our own building. We didn't have a big staff. We didn't have a lot of money. And a season happened in 2018 where the church actually was starting to run out of money completely. Um, that was very significant in Dustin's life. He's told that story before. That's when he was downsized from that staff, and God launched him off into the adventure of church planting, and now he's pastor here. Praise God. Yeah. Um, but hard times financially in 2018 at this church. And a credit to the lead pastor at the time and to the elders, um, they realized, you know, I think this is a season of where we need to repent. And they, they looked at all the, the elders and leaders, and we were all tithing, and we were, we were giving, <laughs> Um, but they realized, you know, let's, just, let's not just call the people of the church to repent. We need to repent too as leaders. And so what this turned into was a season of just going before the Lord and repenting. And, and we weren't even sure of what, but we were desperate. And we knew that this little church was about to cease to exist if the Lord didn't move. And so we were just repenting in desperation. And it was a really sweet time. And now this church is a church that like Wellspring, knows about the gifts of the Spirit and, and believes and, and expects God to work. And so that's part of the equation here. But I would not say that was a church that was in any way characterized by, by power and by outpourings. It wasn't something that we had seen on any regular basis, especially corporately, until this time of repentance. And we were gathering daily. The church was open every day. I saw people receive prophecies and words of knowledge that had never done that before. I, I went through one entire staff meeting. I don't even know how this happened, where we were just listening to the Holy Spirit the whole time. It was so cool. And that is, this had never happened at that church before. And we had, I think at least once a week for a few weeks, we had just like a, a prayer and worship gathering that was pretty informal. It was overseen and led by me and the other pastors but we're, where we were kind of just listening to the Holy Spirit. And I have personally never experienced a powerful corporate encounter with the Holy Spirit like I did during this time of repentance. And what was so remarkable to me is, yes, we were a church that believed in the power of God and we were open, but we were not gathering to pray for an outpouring. We weren't gathering to ask the Lord to pour out his spirit. We were gathering to repent. And there was an outpouring. It was incredible. And I remember uh, the Lord spoke to me some really precious things in that season, including 
that he said, in this church that was running out of money and about to cease to exist and didn't own their own property, he said, now you're ready for a building. Now you're in this spot of desperation and repentance. And sure enough, the Lord turned the ship around for that church and they were able to get back to a place of, of stability and they're now meeting in a, in a permanent building that God provided for them coming out of that season. And it's, it's a really beautiful thing that God did, but it happened while they were repenting. And after this experience, I began to notice this all throughout the New Testament. This is actually not an isolated event. This is actually how the Lord loves to move. So I want to invite you to turn your Bibles to Matthew 3. We're going to begin, or we're going to continue rather in our series, The Gospel of the Kingdom, where we're looking at the Gospel of Matthew. I'm going to read this passage in its entirety, just five verses, beginning in verse 7. But when John the Baptist saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance and do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father, for I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the ax is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. So John the Baptist, typical prophet, brings a pretty intense word of repentance. But if you have eyes to see it, there's also an unimaginably beautiful invitation here. But let's look at a Let's look at how he sets it up. Beginning in verse 7, when John the Baptist saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to his baptism, he said, you brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. Now, a few things about the scene here. Now, we know from the Gospel of John uh, that God actually called John the Baptist to baptize. So he wasn't just an excited guy that wanted to go out there and do something for God. God had actually told John to do this. This was a move of God. And in this scene, we see Pharisees and Sadducees coming to the baptism of John. Now, the Pharisees, they were not what we would call clergy. They didn't have an official position in the church of Israel. They were rabbis, which means teachers. They would teach the scriptures. They would teach in synagogues. Now, the synagogue phenomenon had occurred when the people of God had been exiled. They were away from the temple. They couldn't worship in the temple as God had told them to. And so they had developed this system of just meeting in little houses of teaching called synagogues. And if you're, if you're familiar at all with modern Judaism, that continues to this day. The, the idea of gathering in a synagogue and hearing a rabbi teach the scriptures, that began with people like the Pharisees. So they were teachers and rabbis who kind of basically found ways to adapt Judaism when they couldn't do it in the Levitical way with the priests and the sacrifices. The rabbinical system we have right now, because even to this day in Israel, there is no temple, there's no sacrifices that take place. The way that they do Judaism is the Pharisee way, teaching the Torah in the synagogues. That's who the Pharisees were. Now, the Sadducees were in many ways the opposites of the Pharisees. They actually were, uh, many of them were priests, like that God had said in Leviticus, hey, priests, wear this and perform these rituals and do these sacrifices. In this time, that was uh, comprised of a group of wealthier uh, Jews called the Sadducees. And the Sadducees had learned how to adapt to the fact that Israel was always being conquered and dominated by foreign powers. At this time, it was Rome. And so the Sadducees actually played nice with Rome. I think they figured, well, if if Rome is, is the rulers, if they're kind of the overlords, then we play nice with them and we get to keep being priests. 
we get along with them. Maybe we compromise where we have to. Then we get to keep our status and our position. So what happens here is that the Pharisees are loved by the people. The Sadducees are loved by the Roman overlords. Both have a position. It's a different position, but together they kind of comprise those who lead and rule the Jewish people and who shepherd the Jewish people in their worship of God. And both have seemingly become sort of addicted to their position and their influence. And John is calling them out on it. He's not only calling them out, he's actually warning them. He calls them a brood of vipers. Now brood, if you're not familiar with this word, it means the children of. He's calling them, these, you're snakes, you're the sons of vipers, which means, of course, you're the sons of Satan. He's not mincing words here with these guys. Uh, he says, you guys are the sons of Satan. Jesus is going to use this same phrase, brood of vipers, to, just, to talk about Pharisees later in the Gospel of Matthew. And Jesus actually clarifies why he is calling them this. It is because they are greedy and self-indulgent. If you and me were expecting something that was going to make us feel uh, less uh, called to task, that's what it is, greed and self-indulgence. Anybody guilty of those this week? Right, that is what their main issue was. They were greedy and self-indulgent, which meant that they prized their position, which enabled them to take advantage of the people to sort of gain, whether it was through you know, gathered tithes and donations or, or whatever, they use their position, the Pharisees, their position with the people, the Sadducees, their position with Rome for greed and self-indulgence. They weren't actually concerned with the things of God. They were concerned with their positions as ministers of God. Now in verse eight, John the Baptist says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. And he says this to them because something extremely significant is happening in the world. A great separation is taking place because Messiah has come. John is about to warn them that to be on the wrong side of this will be catastrophic. And to be on the right side of it will be to experience something almost too good to be true. And let me pause here because this is a message that I lose frequently. It's the message that there is no middle. There is, there is no neutral. You're going to worship and serve Jesus, or you're going to be a son of Satan. There's not a middle. There's not a neutral. There's not a keeping your options open. He's telling them, you got to be one or the other. And he, you can almost hear him saying, hey, God told me to do this, man. <laughs> Like, I'm just telling you what he told me to say. Or maybe he loved it, I don't know. I wouldn't love it. <laughs> but he's warning them, hey, someone is coming. The Messiah is coming. But if you keep doing what you're doing, you're going to miss it. That's why he says, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. I don't think God necessarily dislikes it when someone repents in a moment, when they come down and repent. These guys were coming to get baptized. Let's assume that they were coming down for good reasons. That that day they were like, you know what? I'm not the best rabbi. I'm not the best priest. I should go down to the river and repent. And what John is saying to them is, guys, not good enough. You're going to have to keep this up. You're going to have to actually change how you live or you're going to miss what God is doing. Not only will you miss it, you will be judged catastrophically. All right, and then in verses 9 and 10, John says this, Do not presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you, God is able from these stones to raise up children for Abraham. Even now the axe is laid to the root of the trees. Every tree, therefore, that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. So they're warned here by John not to put any stock in their Jewishness. Yes, their God is real. Their God is true. Remember what Jesus said to the woman at the well, who was a Samaritan. He said, salvation is from the Jews. There's even a moment where Jesus tells his followers, listen to the Pharisees. Because their God is real. Their faith is the true faith. 
But a time has now arrived in which true faith in Israel's God means faith in the Messiah. That's how it's going to be proved. And there is no third option. You will either repent, which will enable you to accept and believe and follow the Messiah, or you'll lose everything. The Messiah has no rivals. He has no equals. He's not going to share the podium, if you will, with the Pharisees and the Sadducees. He is king. His kingdom has come, and he is the king of the kingdom. And John is warning them there are two options, judgment or joining his movement and being filled with God's spirit. Those are your only two options. And when he says that the ax uh, is laid at the root of the tree, what John is saying here is that judgment in this case cannot be prevented by repentance or anything else. It's going to come. He's letting them know their only hope is to avoid it for themselves. And he's about to tell them how to do it. In verse 11, John says, I baptize you with water for repentance, but he who is coming after me is mightier than I, whose sandals I am not worthy to carry. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. And here we get to the heart of God's plan, not just for Jerusalem, not just for that region, not just for the priests and the rabbis, but for the whole world of people filled with the Holy Spirit. And here, John the Baptist introduces a person. He talks about someone mightier than himself. And John in his day was a great prophet. Some historians have said that in their respective lifetimes, Jesus was never more popular than John the Baptist was. That his movement was massive. There are actually small religious groups to this day that trace their religion to John the Baptist. John was massively influential and popular. And John is about to say, someone is coming whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. And it, it wasn't just his popularity that made him great. Jesus himself said that John is the greatest to ever live before the coming of the kingdom. That John was the greatest of all the prophets, greater than Moses, greater than Elijah. John is the greatest ever to come. And John is about to say, I am not worthy to untie the sandal of the one who baptizes in the spirit. And the person, of course, is Jesus. And this will be made clear in the passage that Dustin's gonna preach next week. Now, what is the fire here? Now, I have tried for years to see this as a positive thing because I like that. I like the idea of being baptized in fire. God, bring your fire. It's... Awesome, we put it in a lot of songs. And occasionally, scripture will use fire to represent God's blessing, as in the tongues of fire that came on them in Acts 2. Uh, but more often, fire represents God's judgment. And that seems to be the case here, because uh, right after this in verse 12, John says, again, of the one who is coming, he says, his winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into the barn, but the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now we're not an agricultural people, most of us. I grew up on a chicken farm, but I still don't know much about wheat. <laughs> but the basic image here is that the, the entire plant has been gathered into the barn, it's been harvested and cut down, and now there's the threshing that's about to happen where the wheat, the useful part, is separated from everything else. And the wheat is saved and everything else is burned up. That is the image. And the person who's going to do the separating is Jesus, the Messiah. That's the warning that John gives them here. Uh, it's a strict warning. And uh, John seems to know that if they're going to pay attention, it's got to be vivid and it's got to be clear, and apparently it's got to be terrifying. But in it, there's also an invitation. Don't be destroyed. Be saved. Believe in the one I'm talking about. Be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Now, most of us, when we read this text, and I've done this most of my life, we jump immediately to the eternal big picture meaning of these words. And it 
echoes other biblical passages that talk about the judgment on the last day when Christ will be the judge of all people. But that's not the only thing going on here, as some biblical scholars have pointed out. And one clue of that is that John seems to connect both of the possible outcomes to the coming of this person, the Messiah, this person who is going to both save and evidently destroy. Now, we know that God's final judgment wasn't a new concept. John's not introducing that. So what is he introducing? Well, I want to propose to you today that what John, these events that he's talking about, there's actually an immediate meaning of what he's talking about that's going to happen in that generation. And that there is also an ongoing meaning and also an eternal meaning. And I hope that's not too much information, but if you stick with me, I think it will be worth it. And this is true both for the coming of the Spirit and for the, for the judgment. And let's look for the, first at the coming of the Spirit, because I think this will be more familiar to you, and maybe it will help us understand the judgment part. So talking about the baptism of the Spirit, there is an immediate, an initial meaning that John has in view here. And that, of course, is that the Holy Spirit is going to fall, uh, which happens at Pentecost in Acts 2. If you're not familiar with the narrative, it's at the end of the Gospels and into the book of Acts, what happens is that Jesus is crucified for the sins of the world. And he promises before he's ever crucified, he says the Holy Spirit will come, but not until I'm glorified. The Holy Spirit can't come until I'm glorified. And so he dies on the cross. On the third day, he rises again. Again, he promises the Holy Spirit. He tells his followers to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. He ascends to the right hand of God the Father. And as they're waiting, Acts 2 recounts that the Holy Spirit falls on the apostles and everyone who was with them. And this is the beginning of the church. This is the beginning of those who are filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, that's the beginning of us as Christians. It begins with an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. That's what happened in that generation. So that is the initial meaning that the Messiah will baptize in the Holy Spirit. But there's also, as we well know, an ongoing meaning, right? For one thing, uh, it happened in Acts 2. And something interesting happens, and you can go to the next slide about the ongoing meaning. It happens in Acts 2. And something amazing happens in Acts 4. You see, in Acts 2, the Holy Spirit fills them all, and Peter preaches, and there's boldness, and thousands are saved. And then pushback comes. Pushback from Satan comes in the form of oppression from the leaders. And the believers want to keep preaching, but evidently they now feel a lack of boldness. The Holy Spirit had come, and they were bold, and then they were scared, and now they're not so bold. And so in Acts 4, they, decide, they ask God, okay, God, will you make us bold to preach so that we will listen to you rather than to those who are threatening us? And the scripture says that the Holy Spirit came and filled them all in Acts 4, and the room shook. So they were filled again. They had seen it happen once. And now they had confidence to ask, God, give us boldness again. And the Holy Spirit comes again. So the giving of the Spirit is actually an ongoing thing that the Messiah does. And he still does it. And by the way, we tend to speak, when we speak of the baptism of the Spirit, we tend to talk about uh, the initial time that the Holy Spirit comes on us when we believe. And, and for all of us in this room, that didn't happen in Acts 2, it happened when you put your faith in Jesus. So the ongoing ministry of the Holy Spirit, of the giving of the Holy Spirit, continues to this day. And you see, my friends, what Jesus accomplished then is still good for you now. When Jesus went to the cross, Scripture says that he bore God's wrath in our place. Scripture says that we are made clean by his blood and we repent of our sins and turn to him and believe. And we're made clean, not just so that we can go to heaven one day, but so the Holy Spirit can come on us now. 
So the, the ongoing ministry of Messiah is to pour out the Spirit on all who believe. So again, when, when John says the Messiah is going to baptize in the Holy Spirit, there's that initial meaning. It was the, the giving of the Holy Spirit to the church, which began the whole thing. And then there's the ongoing giving of the Holy Spirit, which he did for them and he continues to do for us. And then, of course, there's a final meaning. There's an eternal meaning. Jesus said to the woman at the well in John 4, whoever drinks of the water that I will give will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. So my friends, when Jesus filled you with the Holy Spirit, your eternity began. It doesn't begin later. It began the moment the Holy Spirit came into you. That's eternity put into you by God. That's the promise and the presence that seals you for eternity. Your eternal life begins now. And so when John promises the baptism of the Holy Spirit, there's an eternal implication for that. That he is going to seal his people with his presence, beginning in their lives and echoing on into eternity. All right, so does that make sense? There's the initial thing that John is promising, but it also has an ongoing implication, and it has an eternal implication. All right, so let's look at the judgment of fire, because I believe it's the same thing going on here. Now, the initial meaning of the judgment or the baptism of fire, there's an event that Jesus is going to talk about a good bit throughout the Gospel of Matthew and the other synoptic Gospels. And it's the coming destruction of the temple. And I believe that John the Baptist also has that in view here, especially because he is warning the Jewish leaders. Now, if you're not familiar with this story, let me tell you, it's not included in the New Testament. The New Testament mainly just tells us about the early, uh, of the early ministry of the apostles in Jerusalem and some of the early missionary journeys of Paul and a few other details. And after that, we have to rely on church history. So what, but this, these events were predicted in scripture, um, which is why I have these, uh, the scripture notes here. Matthew 24 is one of the places this is predicted. So what is going to happen is Jesus is going to tell his followers many times that when Jerusalem is attacked, when it's besieged in certain ways, that they should flee to the hills. He's going to make that abundantly clear to them, and he says it to them a bunch of times. He promises the temple is going to be destroyed, and he tells them in so many words, you'll need to flee when this happens. Well, in AD 66, some 30-odd years after Christ ascended into heaven, there's a revolt in Jerusalem, a Jewish revolt, typical situation where the, the colonizing group, the Romans, were overtaxing them and oppressing them, and there was religious disagreement, and the Jewish people had had enough, and they revolt. And in uh, the year 66, the, uh, the Romans send a general to try to put down the rebellion. Um, the general's name was Cestius Gallus, and he invaded the city and sieged it. But he actually did not complete the siege. He ended up retreating. And the Christians thought, okay, Jesus warned us that this was going to happen, and it seems like it's happening. And there were other, you know, there were people receiving prophetic words from the Spirit at the time, and I can't go into the whole story, but the Christian community believed it was time to leave. And Christian scholar Epiphanes says this, it is very remarkable that not a single Christian perished in the destruction of Jerusalem. Though there were many there when Cestius Gallus invaded the city, and had he persevered in the siege, he would have soon rendered himself master of it but he unexpectedly and unaccountably raised the siege and the Christians took the opportunity to escape. And then four years later, Vespasian was approaching with his army, but all who uh, believed in Christ had left Jerusalem and most of them fled to a city called Pella. Interestingly, they would have crossed the Jordan right over there where John had preached and warned the Pharisees and Sadducees to flee the judgment. They crossed the Jordan into the Decapolis, into the Transjordan region, and most of the Christians fled to a city called Pella in that area, fled toward the hills just as Jesus had told them to. 
And so they marvelously escaped the general shipwreck of their country. Not one of them perished. And if you know church history, you know that the church in Jerusalem was one of the most important churches in early Christianity. That church survived because they all fled to Pella during this war and and Jerusalem was horribly sieged and conquered and the temple was destroyed to its present state where there's only the one wall left of the original city of Jerusalem. That happened 2000 years ago. Jesus warned that it would happen, but the Christians who had put their faith in Messiah were warned and they had fled. And afterwards they returned to Jerusalem and the church in Jerusalem thrived. The church is still in Jerusalem, took a lot of heavy blows under the Islamic conquest and things like that. But the church in Jerusalem thrived because they had fled in answer to Jesus' warnings. So in his initial warning, in the initial meaning of John's warning, John is warning these guys. The temple is going to be destroyed. Jerusalem will be destroyed. This judgment is coming. For whatever reason, Jesus knew it was going to come. He did not tell them, repent, maybe it won't come. He said, it's definitely coming. And and what happened, my friends, when the temple was destroyed, the Sadducees to this day have ceased to exist. They were priests. Their job was to offer temple sacrifices. Sadduceeism was destroyed permanently. The only Sadducees who would have continued on are the ones who left that and put their faith in Jesus. So that was the initial meaning of the judgment. Now there's also an ongoing meaning, and I think this is kind of interesting. I don't think we talk about this a lot as Christians. The ongoing meaning of escaping judgment is I think things like this continue to happen, where those who put their faith in Jesus have actually put their faith in the only one who can spare them from the calamities of life. Again, to be separate from Christ in this life means separation from the only one who has any power over life's calamities. Now, as a pastor, I want to say this very carefully. Jesus does not shield us from all of life's calamities. He's with us through all of life's calamities. He doesn't shield us from all of them. But to be with him and to be close to him is to be with the only one who can do anything about them. Yeah, amen. And so sometimes we go through them. Sometimes we perish and we end up in his arms. We die and it goes that way. Sometimes through revelation, through miracles, through wisdom, he shields us from the calamities of life as he will do from his followers at the siege of Jerusalem. There is a very real sense in which if you're a Pharisee like like Nicodemus, who heeds the warning and puts your faith in Jesus, that you actually will escape that particular calamity, the one that was about to befall Jerusalem. That's part of the warning that John gives. Turn to the Messiah and you'll escape this calamity. We'll see this happen all the time. In Acts 27, for instance, there's a shipwreck. This is... Paul, when he's on his missionary journey in Acts 27, there's a shipwreck, but Paul prays and asks God, and he he lets everyone on the ship know no, no one's going to die. The ship's going to be lost, but no one's going to die. He, I won't even tell the whole story, but he gives them wisdom and how to do it, and it turns out everyone, even those who cannot swim, survive this first century shipwreck with no life vests because God gave them revelation and gave them wisdom because they were close to Christ. The only one who could have saved them from that shipwreck did. So there's an ongoing sense in which staying close to Christ means in many cases, he shields us and protects us from the calamities of life. And of course, the final meaning of of this judgment of fire is that to be separate from Christ means eternal and final judgment. In John 5, 24, Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever hears my words and believes him who sent me has eternal life. He does not come into judgment, but has passed from death to life. So the warning that John gives is is eternal as well. It's 
turn from your sin, turn to the Messiah, and that's gonna matter to you when Jerusalem falls. That's gonna matter after that, and it's going to matter eternally. It's a big warning. Now, uh, part of the reason I bring this up, listen, as a preacher, the easiest thing for me would have been to just talk about the eternal part, because that's the part you all knew already. (laughs) But I wanted to bring up some of the immediate and ongoing implications of this warning, because I think that those are ways that we are guided toward the eternal. Does that make sense? By, By following Jesus in the immediate ways that he puts right before us, that's our, our surest uh, path towards walking with him and knowing him. That's our surest path toward repentance. If we make it too abstract, too later on, I think we're in danger of missing it completely. So again, John's warning is stark because there is no middle ground. You can't have the spirit and your old ways, the things that make you feel important or give you influence, your greed, your self-indulgence. The warning is harsh because the consequences are big. Now, I want to talk about uh, the way that John tells them, hey, you're headed towards judgment. How do you switch? How do you get out of that? The answer, of course, is repentance. How does John define this repentance for them? And let's pay attention to this because I think this is how John, how scripture is going to define repentance for us. Well, first of all, he says, again, it's not based on your Jewishness. It's not based on race. It's remarkable that the Jewish Christians we see in the New Testament saw their Jewishness as relatively meaningless compared to knowing Christ. That's amazing. They were God's chosen people, the children of Abraham. They had the promises. They had the Torah. But even before the temple was destroyed, Paul is going to say this in Philippians 3. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also, if anyone thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. He's like, if you're going to brag about your Jewishness, well, let me go first. (laughs) Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, Hebrew of Hebrews, as to the law, Pharisee, As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, as to the righteousness under the law, blameless. But whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. I love this in verse 8. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of all things and count them as rubbish in order that I may gain Christ. I don't, know, I don't know what happened there. Um, hopefully you were able to listen to the verse. Um, in order that he may know Christ, he counts all of his accolades as a Jewish person as rubbish. For Paul, having now encountered the Messiah, having tasted and seen that the Lord is good, Paul is going to say, The rest of it doesn't mean anything to me anymore. This is what John is inviting them into, inviting them into something astronomically and infinitely better than being a priest, a Jewish priest, astronomically and infinitely better than being a respected Jewish rabbi. He's inviting them into a relationship with the Messiah. He tells them it must be fruitful. In other words, he's telling them, you got to make some conscious choices, guys, in the direction of repentance how you spend your time, how you spend your money, the words you say or don't say, the way that you love, who you love, how you forgive, it's gonna matter. These men, these priests and rabbis, they're lovers of their positions. They're willing to do the external work as a show to the people that they're on the side of God's prophet. But this alone will not prepare them to encounter and believe the Messiah, which is their only chance of escaping the wrath to come. And so my friends, I return to my original point. God's plan for the world is to have a people filled with the Holy Spirit. And the way for us to be a part of that is to repent. 
the way for us to be a part of that is to repent. Now, I told you the story of my, my former church, Christ Community Church. And as we were repenting, and as God was pouring out his spirit, I remember one of the leaders said in a prayer one day, he said, Lord, I'm realizing we've been trying to do this without you. We were Christians, right? We, we had chosen Messiah. We had chosen Jesus. But we realized we didn't know it before. We thought we were being pretty faithful, pretty regular Christians doing church. But we realized in that moment of repentance that we'd been trying to do it all without Jesus. Interestingly, um, you might be familiar with some of the scathing rebukes that Jesus gives the churches in Revelation. I like returning to these. I don't know why. Uh, In Revelation 3, verses 19 through 21, this is Jesus talking to the church in Laodicea. He says, those whom I love, and by the way, Jesus says all this because he loves you. Every single thing he's saying, every word he gave to the Pharisees and Sadducees is because he loved them. Didn't want any, any of them to repent. He loves them and he loves you. He says, those whom I love, I reprove and discipline. So be zealous and repent. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. Doesn't that sound good? Fellowship with Jesus, the one who conquers, to the one who conquers, I will grant him to sit with me on my throne as I also conquered and sat down with my father on my throne. Notice the language here. This is Jesus talking to the early church. We, we sometimes, I think, idolize the early church a little bit. If only, Lord, we could be like the early church. Well, apparently they had the same problem. They were doing church without Jesus. Jesus is telling a church, I'm knocking at the door. Are you gonna let me in? Are you going to keep doing this without me, or are you going to let me in? They were doing church without Jesus. I think that we should be healthily suspect of ourselves, that we might be prone at times to doing church without Jesus, to doing Christianity without Jesus. So how can we make sure we're doing Christianity with Jesus? Because ultimately, I think God has no problem with rabbis right? He has no problem with rabbis teaching in the synagogue. He has no problem with the Pharisees and their love for the scriptures. He has no problem with the Sadducees who were literally the priests that he told to be priests. He just has a problem with them doing it without him. Messiah had shown up and they were like, oh no, no, we don't need you. Oh no, you do need him. Without him, the rest of it is pointless. Without him, the rest of it is meaningless. Without him, the rest of it is actually going to be judged and destroyed. So how do we make sure that we're doing Christianity with Jesus? Now, I, there's no way I could possibly cover all the different ways that we can make sure we're doing this. And I will say, um, part of the reason I, I think God called my friend Dustin to be a pastor and to be a pastor here is because he's good at this, if I can say that. I think Dustin is good at this. I think he doesn't like to do Christianity. Yeah, yeah, honor him, absolutely. <laughs> I don't think he likes to do Christianity without Jesus. I think he's, he's seen enough of that. He's not interested in that. And a lot of the things he's going to ask us to do and the time he's going to ask us to give up seeking and pursuing is because he doesn't want this church to ever fall into this, to be a church that does it without Jesus. Uh, uh, one of the things we can do, and this is something that, that I've learned and, I, and I've noticed a lot of leaders don't like to do this because leaders, we kind of think our job is to do what I'm doing today, which is tell everybody else what to do and to do it all ourselves, right? Uh, one of the best things we can do if you're a leader in here, and I'm talking parents, small group leaders, all of it, is to empower people to use their gifts. It's one of the hugest ways that people get in the game is using the gifts that the Holy Spirit gave them. Shepherd them, guide them, correct them, but empower them. And we were at youth camp a couple weeks ago, and we had a really interesting thing happen where we were in the, the big room where all the, the youth had been worshiping, and we had just our youth group from Wellspring left in there afterwards doing small group. And one of our youth, Jolie Landreth, uh, we were starting our small group time, and she she felt like, she has a gift of discernment, and she felt like, I, th- I think there's a dark presence in here. 
And other youth were like, ooh, yes, yes, sensing that, yes. And another youth was like, I was so like, sad and depressed and I couldn't figure out why. And it had been a good service, it had been an honoring service. The teaching was good, the worship had been good, but, but several of them were discerning a dark presence in the room. And that's a gift of the spirit, by the way, the gift of discernment. Guess who wasn't discerning a dark presence in the room? <laughs> the leader. And I love that. It's not my job to have every gift. As a leader and as a pastor, it's my job to empower and shepherd. And so some, someone was, several were discerning a dark presence in the room and Hunter and I conferred and, and one of Hunter's great gifts is um, just getting a sense of, of an action item. Here's what we should do right now. So he spread us all out around the room and we start praying. And, and Kirsten, who you know, has a great gift of, of worship and of prophecy begins singing and we're singing little bits of songs that we know, Holy Spirit, you're welcome here. And we're praying and we're crying out and nine, 10 minutes in, it didn't take all night. Some of these students with discerning gifts were like, okay, angels are here. The darkness is left. <laughs> yeah, amen. And then we have small group, you know? And, and the next day they all felt freedom in that room. They felt like whatever had been bothering them, them lifted. And it was sweet, but I love that we didn't do small group without Jesus, that we let him interrupt us. And, and the one contributing piece I had to that was that I didn't shut it down just because it wasn't my idea, just because I didn't discern it. Um, and so I think being people who empower the gifts is a huge way uh, that we can be sure we're not doing Christianity without Jesus. And band, I'll go ahead and invite you guys on up here and I'll close with this. When I preached a few weeks ago, uh, I encouraged you guys not to do Christianity alone. Do you remember that? That, that we have to be the church. We have to do it together. And I think that's a pretty modern problem. I don't think the historic church has had that problem. I don't think that the global church has that problem. But I think in the West, in America, I think the individualism kind of creeps in and, and we try to do it alone. But what I'm talking about today, trying to do Christianity without Jesus, um, that apparently is common throughout church history. It was common in Jesus' day, it was common in the days of John the Baptist, I think it's probably common now. So I wanna encourage you, again, God's plan for the world is to have a people who are filled with the Holy Spirit. And the way for us to be a part of that is repentance. Now, let the Holy Spirit guide you in repentance. Repentance can look like a lot of different things, but if you get overwhelmed sometimes by what am I supposed to repent of today, Lord? Then I want to give you one handle. Just ask the Lord, how have, I been, how have I been trying to do it without you? Ask the Lord, how have I been trying to do my life without you? How have I been trying to do Christianity without you? And then repent of that. And I want to encourage you, like John the Baptist does, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Meaning, uh, if you need to change something in your schedule, if you need to establish a habit or a rhythm that helps you do something with Jesus, that's a part of repentance. I, I visited another church a couple weeks ago, and um, the pastor asked, well, who reads their Bible pretty much every day? And I was like, well, I kind of raised my hand, and Kirsten was like, no, you do, raise your hand. <laughs> and the pastor said, that is a desire issue. And I was like, okay, I, I could see that. But for me, it's not desire that gets me out of bed at 6 a.m., it was desire that helped me set the alarm. I'm, you know, it was desire that had me sit down and think about a schedule in which I will spend time with the Lord. It's pretty practical. And I'm telling you guys, a lot of the time repentance looks like this. It looks like quiet, wise, practical ways of making sure you're not living your life apart from Jesus. I'm reading a book. I think a lot of you guys have read it. Atomic Habits. Anybody read this? It's helpful. I don't even think the guy's a Christian. He's just about how to have good habits. But it's a lot of research. And, and one of the things he says in it is, if you don't establish a date, time, and place for the thing you say you're going to do, you're not going to do it. Statistically speaking, it's probably not going to happen if you don't. And some of you guys were like me when I was single and had no kids and was unmarried. I did all the stuff without any of that. 
Um, but now I do have to do that. I have to be disciplined. I have to set a date and a time and a place to do certain things or I'll never do them. And so I want to encourage you guys, um, you can go ahead and stand. During this worship time, uh, ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, how have I been trying to do it without you? Lord, is there something I need to put in my life so that I'm not living my life, so I'm not trying to do Christianity apart from you? Uh, if, you're, if you want to, pray for Wellspring. If you have an idea for how Wellspring can do better in this, of being a church that, that does Christianity with Jesus, that we're a church that actually continues to listen to Jesus, come let the leaders know if the Lord gives you something, an idea or a revelation. We want to be a church that does Christianity with Jesus. That's the action of repentance I want to call us to today. Lord, you're worth repenting for. We thank you that you pour out your spirit on all who repent and come to you. We thank you that it is not your desire to have to judge anyone in fire, but to pour out your spirit, God, because your desire is that all would come to believe. God, we ask that as we repent, God, uh, that you would come in your fullness and do all of the things that we know you to do. And prove yourself to be all that you said that you are. We love you and we worship you. We pray it in the holy name of Jesus. Amen.